Welcome to the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. This is your Friday Roundup. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Okay, guys, congratulations. You have made it to the weekend, and this is your Friday Roundup. I'm super excited to get a chance to talk about the Monday episode with the Green Swan and also talk a little bit today about this idea of perfect utilization. And to help me do this, I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, I'm doing well, Jonathan. We have had a really exciting week here in the Chooseify world. We had uh, Scott Rickens and his crew here filming for a couple of days for the upcoming documentary, Playing With Fire. And it was just like, the coolest two days I've experienced in a long, long time. I know I'm sure, Jonathan, you can uh, tell the audience a little better than than I, but it was a really surreal experience, right? Yeah, it blew my mind, Brad. And you know what this documentary is? It's poetic justice. And what I mean by that is over the last 30, 40, 50 years, there has been a tidal wave of media, movies, pop culture, radio ads, marketing. That sole purpose is to convince you to part with your last hard-earned dollar and every hard-earned dollar that you're bringing home. Everybody has something to sell you. But the beauty of creating a message through the powerful medium of film is that it can be channeled for a force of good. (laughs) You don't have to live paycheck to paycheck. You don't have to always say yes to every single marketing ad that shows up on your TV. It's not your responsibility to fix the economy by spending every last dollar that you make. Your family is more important. Pay yourself first. And that's a message that has really just got lost in the noise of just consumerism. There's very few documentaries that will will change your life. There's certainly documentaries that are informative, but life-changing? That's got to be a much smaller group. And I got to say, maybe there was this cynical part of me that thought that this was going to be you know, an amateur hour type project. Maybe this was going to be something that was just a, obviously a super low budget thing that was going to come off as kind of corny or, or forced or cobbled together. And I can tell you without reservation that you do not have to worry about that. The guys that are doing this are professionals and the quality that they're bringing to the table is unparalleled. So this documentary is in great hands. And now having just been kind of behind the scenes and seen what they're doing, I am more convinced than ever that this is the biggest thing to happen, not only in the FI community, but in the personal finance community as well. Yeah, I agree. And and to say that it wasn't amateur hour is maybe the biggest understatement of the world. It was it was incredible. I know uh, Ray, who's the director of photography and his team, which are Kyle and Zippy, they were just top, top notch. I mean, Ray, according, I'm looking at the Playing With Fire website and Ray is a three time Emmy award winning filmmaker. I mean, that's craziness. And he was just like, in our houses, filming us doing the podcast and, you know, just a day in the life of each of us, plus this amazing barbecue get together we had on Monday night. I mean, it was just like you said, it's hard to even fathom. Like when you hear, oh, there's going to be a FI documentary, you think, oh, that's cute. Like that's going to be pretty neat. But man, this is top class in every way possible. And it doesn't stop here. You know, this documentary is not limited to Richmond, Virginia and two guys that are sharing their message on a podcast. Scott with this crew is traveling literally, and I'm trying not to just use that too casually, but he is literally traveling all over the world. Obviously he was here on the East Coast here in Richmond. He's already been to the West Coast to see Vicky Robin from Your Money or Your Life. He's been in Longmont, Colorado for the grand opening of the world headquarters of Mr. Money Mustache. He's going to Ecuador for Chautauqua. He's going to be going to FinCon in Dallas. He's going down to Florida for Camp Fi. And his intent is to really try to represent all the unique ways that people tackle this journey and really talk to many of the influencers that have shaped where this movement is going. To be able to put all these different people, all these different thoughts and ideas and interviews together into one compelling story. We've talked about the value of just getting the message out there and how sometimes it can be difficult to do the heavy lifting yourself. 
this is a vehicle that is going to reach an audience that this podcast never will. It's going to reach an audience that blogs never will. It is going to reach people all around the world. This documentary is going to be translated into 20 different languages. It's going to have mass distribution on a major platform, potentially like Netflix or Amazon or Facebook. One of these major portals is going to distribute this all around the world. And you guys are behind the scenes on this. This is your story. And I hope we did our part to help, man, because that was that was an intense moment. <laughs> yeah, it sure was. And, and like you said, we are just a very, very small part of this and a very small part of the community at large, but it's getting this community together. And I think this documentary is going to lend an air of credibility and legitimacy to the Fi community that, well, we all know that it's legitimate, but there's something else when you have a major level documentary appear, like Jonathan said, on, on one of those Amazon or Netflix or Facebook, one of those type of platforms that have world changing powers. So obviously we can go on and on and on about this. It, it was just a wonderful experience. Like I said earlier, it is a little surreal to have cameras following you around all day. But I mean, like we had cameras when me and my kids were walking to the bus stop in the morning. It was a little peculiar. And obviously it's just some regular dude sitting in a, in a house in Richmond. But hopefully it can just show that really anybody can follow this path. As we always say, like we are not special in any way, shape or form. We just have made choices that focus on happiness and that focus on intentionality with our lives, that we can actually deal with the important things in life as opposed to just keeping up with the Joneses or just, as Jonathan always says, being on the hamster wheel and working so many hours to pay for the expensive houses and cars like everybody else. We reject all that. We live this intentional life here and it's really not that hard. It's not that hard to make these few choices. And and I hope that in our small way yeah, that was communicated and will come through on this documentary. So guys, if you've been listening to this show for the last couple of months, you know that Brad and I have been discussing this idea of community and how we can help foster that community through this platform. One of the reasons we're so motivated to do that is we have people reaching out to us from Canada, Dubai, Australia, England, and obviously all over the United States saying that there is a need there. There is an unmet need. People are looking for a way to connect in their local geographic region. And so Brad, do you want to go ahead and take a few minutes and talk about what we came up with? So yeah, we had a ton of people reach out to us to volunteer to be community leaders in their different cities throughout the country and really throughout the world, incredibly enough. Uh, and Jonathan and I have spent the last couple of months just trying to figure out like what is the best way to facilitate that? How can we assist? What, what do we even want this to look like? And I think it's important to note that there are a lot of phi and maybe mustachian groups throughout the country. And, and we don't want to step on anyone's toes. That wasn't our intention at all. We just want to foster the community in the, and the overall phi community in any way we can. So uh, if that means there's an existing group in New York City or San Francisco, we would love to just connect our Choose FI people with them. So, uh, you know, we did have some some question about that. So I did want to mention that publicly. But basically what we've come to the conclusion is the easiest way we've heard from a lot of people who use the app Slack and they've said it is just the easiest way to keep in touch with community without it being like this formal, oh, let's send an email to 20 or 30 people or 100 people or whatever it is. It's a lot more immediate. It's a lot easier to use. So we're in the process of trying to figure out how to set up Slack in the most efficient manner for the Chooseify community. And if you are an expert, if someone's listening to this out there and, and they're just great at Slack, like if you're if you've been using it for years and we could use your help. So just shoot us an email to feedback at choosefi.com. That would be extraordinarily helpful. And then once we get this up and running and have different channels, so uh, that's how it's set up. Basically, we can have a channel for Richmond and Atlanta and Los Angeles and Chicago, Des Moines, Iowa, whatever it may be, right? Like it could be any of these places. And then you're just in touch with the people who are involved in just that channel. So again, it's just a lot more immediate. Whereas like I had this cool little hack that was applicable to Richmond, where there's this company I've used to refinance my mortgage and they drop their rates and it's zero closing costs. It's this wonderful thing. But I actually didn't want to take the time. I just thought it was annoying to send an email. Whereas if we had this Slack channel set up, I would have instantly just jotted that off and told people. And who knows, somebody might have saved a couple thousand bucks. And because I was too lazy or it was too formal to send an email, I didn't do it. 
And if I'm not doing it, and I'm supposedly the leader of this choose a vibe community, then it's just almost like a bridge too far. So anyway, long story short, we are definitely moving on this community idea. And we just are trying to figure out the absolute best way to do it. And and it does seem like the Slack is the best way. So as these Friday roundups go on, once we get this set up, we will have a call for the community at large to join this and we'll set up a special email address and we'll, you know, ask you to join this group. And it'll, uh, I think it'll add a lot of value to your actual day to day life. And that's really the goal is creating this inclusive community. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned. But again, if, if someone out there is, is an expert with Slack, we would love your help. And talking about, you know, sharing resources, Brad, there is a second idea that we had as well that I wanted to go ahead and bring up on the show today. And it is the idea of creating creating a, a digital vault, a choose FI vault, if you will, where we can start sharing not only like all the calculators that you and I have accrued and maybe some of the different resources and documents that we've put together, like the pillars of FI, infographics, that sort of thing, the top 50 recipes that Laura is putting together, but also what we've come to learn, the 30, 40, maybe even 100 different documents that our community has put together and shared with us And they would like to see those distributed out to the community members that would also benefit from it as well. Amortization calculators, price lists for different grocery items, like getting the best prices at different places and how they've tracked them over time. True cost of car ownership calculators, like these really cool hacks that have served them well for the different needs that they had that we think you might find benefit from as well. So we're actively looking into putting together this, essentially what comes down to a digital locker where we can put all these different files that we find useful. And if you have something that you've made that you think other people would benefit from, instead of putting it on a Facebook thread where it gets buried, you know, 10 minutes later, you can add it to the vault and then it'll just be there as a permanent resource for other people that can benefit from it. And the cool thing about it is when you make updates to that file because it needs to be changed or you're you're making it better in any way, shape or form, those are live updates. So people will always have the most up-to-date copy of that file which just is a really, really unique and cool idea. All right, so I'm building that right now. So um, and I, I fully anticipate that by next Friday, I will tell you guys that it's live and I'll also give you the information on how to get access to that. But I really think that's gonna be a valuable resource for you. And I know so many of you have asked, like, how can I get a copy of the essential listening list if if I wanna like catch up on the show quickly? Those are the sorts of resources that I will get put in there for you guys so that you have the most up-to-date information that we have. Yeah, and the long story short with all these items, you know, unfortunately, we don't have anything for you to actually sign up today, but it's this concept of community and that's where we're always trying to build. So please know that like, this is not just a podcast for us. I mean, Jonathan and I, spend easily 40 hours each a week on the choose if I community, just answering emails or thinking through this, trying to come up with different resources and ways to connect people. So we are really working actively to make this happen. And yeah, we hope in the next week or two to have, have some real concrete information for ways you can sign up. But in the meantime, the easiest way to join the community is through our Facebook group. We now have well over 4,000 members in this group, and it's just the most active Facebook group I've ever seen. So just go to choosefi.com slash Facebook and just put in your email address. We'll send you a link to the private group and you're in. So yeah, that's that's the easiest way to join the community now. But as we discussed, we're really trying to just to make this better for all of you out there. Today, we want to talk for a few minutes about the episode that we did this past week with the Green Swan. And really, this was more of a look at entrepreneurship, which I think is a fascinating take for the FI community because there's so much overlap between our community and the business community. And in particular, the small business community, a lot of us are considering the possibility of doing a startup at some point. And I think there's a portion of us that limits ourselves to saying, well, you have to have a really good idea or you have to have this original thought, or you have to think of something that no one else has thought of before. And I think that is a limiting belief, isn't it, Brad? Yeah, it definitely is. And and JW certainly stepped outside the box here and literally bought a company, right? Like that is as far off the beaten path from anybody that I've ever heard of in the FI community. I I don't know of anybody who's done that. I suspect many people have, but it, it's never crossed my plate. I've never seen an article about it or, or anything. So it's an unconventional choice, but JW and his brothers thought that they could add value to a business. And they did a ton of research and they hired a business broker to help them search for a business. This was not just like an, an overnight decision, right? Like they had, there are a lot of considerations, especially when you get into business with your family members. That is fraught with peril. Yeah. And let me tell you that just because it's fraught with peril doesn't mean that it doesn't have appeal or that it's something that you shouldn't consider. I have spent 
probably close to 50 or 60 hours talking with my brother either on the phone or just in person about how we would like to go into a business together. And I think for us, real estate holds some significant appeal just as something that, you know, I understand it's a business model that I understand it's not an original business model, but it's something that most of us intrinsically understand the nature of it and you know where to go get the information if you're willing to put the time in. And so I think for me, listening to JW talk about how the discussions that he had with his brother, to me, that that was critical information that I hadn't considered before. What do you need to be thinking about? How do you set a framework that prevents ultimately what's more important, which is your relationship with family? How do you have both of these going side by side and, and allow both of them to thrive? And when one of them goes south, what structure do you put in place to prevent that from destroying the other half of the story, right? That either your business or your relationship with family. And I thought that it was really cool that they had gone through that process. And I think some of the things they talked about, like what happens in case of a divorce, what happens in case of a death, what happens in case a family member wants to get out and they have a significant vested interest. How do you handle those different approaches? That's just a, a mental framework that is critical to, to talk about and to think through whenever you're talking about going into business with somebody else. Yeah, I thought that was that was really insightful. And and it is very important. It's easy to just kind of jump into business and not and not talk about these things. And and yeah, Jonathan, this was a, a light bulb moment for us because frankly, like we just jumped into quote unquote business together, right? Like, you know, this podcast and website have it just started kind of on a whim. And we just got together for coffee and decided, hey, let's do this fun project. But it's silly that we don't know where it's going to go years from now. And, and we didn't sit down and hammer out these details of just simple things, right? What happens in case of a death or what happens if one of us wants to get out? Like these are important things. And like you and I, we didn't do that at all. And like, that's pretty pathetic when you really think about it. So uh, that's one thing, again, taking action. We need to sit down and have that conversation just because it's the right thing to do. Not because we think this is going to be some crazy business. So, you know, it's, it's nothing like that. It's just, these are important things. And you know, that's one thing we can say to the audience, like we're going to sit down and talk about it and we'll report back to you like on how that went. I think that's a really important thing when when you're first starting out a business and with a new business partner and and just getting on the same page and just talking about things. Open communication is just so important in life, just in every relationship you have. And yeah, I mean, we did not do a great job of that. Well, really, JW just did us a favor. I mean, he just made it easier for us to have this conversation instead of me being, hey, Brad, can we talk about what happens to choose FI if you die? Awkward. Like, or if you just hate the business and want to get out or something like that. Like, instead of me having to be the one to introduce it, JW did all the legwork for us. And now we're just, yeah, actually, maybe we should do that, right? Yeah, I mean, no question. That, that really was a favor. And uh, yeah, we're going to sit down and do it. It's just, it is important and it's it's long overdue. And maybe guys, to some degree, whatever we come up with, we can then share that with you guys. And maybe you'll find that to be reasonable or maybe you'll say... Actually, guys, here's what we did. And this I think this is a, a, a slightly better angle on it. So maybe we can present the ideas that we come up with and then you guys can help us refine those ideas to some degree. Because I'm sure that there is a proper way to approach this that makes sense and it's logical. And we're going to try and take a stab at it. Maybe we can share that with you guys on the on a future show. And Jonathan, JW also did us a favor just because this was just more and, and I'm ashamed to say this, but it wasn't that we were like, really nervous to sit down and and talk about this stuff. It's just, which we may have been, right? If we actually overtly thought about it, but we just literally didn't even think about it, right? Like that never even came up. Hey, let's hammer out all these details. It was more just like, Hey, we're starting a podcast. Like let's, let's just have fun, you know? But like, but it was, it was really kind of silly that we didn't do that. And that it just didn't even cross either of our minds. So yeah, I mean, again, long overdue, but let's just make it happen. First of all, yes, let's make it happen. But I'm just trying to think through the difference. There was no risk, right? I mean, we talked when we did it, this was a side hustle. This was a startup from scratch with very little invested other than our time. And so I think to some degree, I can understand why we were able to bypass it. But you got to say, if you're going to make a significant investment of money in the thousands or tens of thousands of, or potentially even hundreds of thousands of dollars, like JW, there's a higher level of risk involved with this venture. And so we can be intellectually honest and say, uh, take what you need from this conversation and adapt it to your own unique situation. But realize at some point in time, if you have a business that has legs, if you have a business that is going somewhere and that you can see there's a future in that business, this is an important conversation. So we got a little bit of feedback, uh, and this was from Lucas, and he said, I found it a little hard to relate to in terms of acquiring a business for a million dollars. I mean, once I have a million dollars that I could invest in an existing business, I've already hit FI, and I could just keep it in the index fund. Now, I suppose that the learnings from Green Swan could be scaled down to buying a smaller business with people that have a lower net worth 
or don't have partners they trust to buy a business together. And he had a couple other notes, but I want to pause on that. I don't think that JW said that this business costed him a million dollars. I don't think he really specified that. Personally, I don't think it serves much value to focus on the dollar amount that was used to to purchase this business. I think you already kind of nailed it. It's more of the concept. You scale this to what you're actually doing. But I do think that the natural place for us to take this conversation is to more of a rich dad, poor dad aspect, which is instead of buying stuff, and when you look at the cash flow quadrant, you put the money in, it never comes back. JW put his money into something that has the potential to earn income for him in the future. He's purchasing assets. And I completely understand what you're saying. I think different people have different skill sets and risk tolerance. I thought what was so fascinating about it is that JW didn't need this, right? I mean, Brad, when we talked about what he was doing to hit FI, he doesn't need this business in order to hit FI. This was a portion of his investment portfolio. And I think that's so interesting. I got a message from somebody recently and they were basically just asking us, after you finish all your tax deferred vehicles, so you've maxed out your 457, your 403B or your 401K, you've maxed out your HSA. Uh, If you had access to it, you maxed out your traditional IRA or maybe your Roth IRA. And you also have a significant amount of money to put into your taxable investment accounts. What do you do after that? In my mind, just based on the question as it's framed, what I would do is I would look to diversify. And and most likely for me, I would be looking to invest in a business opportunity, whether it be a startup, whether it be real estate, That to me seems like the next place, something that I can get excited about, something that I can understand, something that has the potential for a higher return. And something that really stands out to me as I'm talking about this is the fact that I'm able to accept more risk because I've already taken care of the simple path to wealth. I've already done what I can to create a path for myself that's going to allow me and my family to hit that FI number. And so at this point, I can absorb a little bit more risk and it also allows more of an upshot as well. And you know, the dark side of that is that the business or the venture or the investment could fail more risk. The dark side of risk is that your money could disappear. You go in for lunch, you come out, you've lost $30,000. So it's important to make that distinction. You don't want to go all in on a risky venture. It's very nice that when you've taken care of the little things, your path to FI is going to take care of itself. And then it's a question of what else do you want to try? And keep in mind, we're not talking about buying a Porsche or a Jaguar here, purchasing the latest iPhone. We're talking about buying assets. We're looking at purchasing an additional income stream. And as long as you're not doing that in the vacuum where it's your only venture, you're going to be, you're going to do great, but take care of yourself, take care of your family first through the simple path. And then from there, what else do you want to do? That's my mental framework that I work with. Lucas had a couple other points here. And and really, Lucas, we're just grateful that you took the time to send this in because these are things that we think about as well. And so everything that you're sending us is it really is, is appreciated. He said a couple more things, not to rail on this too much because I look forward to every Monday and Friday show. Uh, how is acquiring an existing business much different than buying a single stock? I mean, it has the added stress of no longer being passive, right? The success of the investment is riding on the shoulders of the new owners. It seems very risky and stressful and all that for a return on investment in the teens. I guess I'd rather just hope for an 8% return in VTSAX and sleep better and have more free time. Plus, I don't have that high number to buy into it. The other piece that's difficult is that these guys are rock stars. They're CPAs and MBAs. So although they're probably riding by the seat of their pants on this one, they're also more well-prepared than 99% of the population. It seems like there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle that would need to be in place for this to pay off. But going back to my original thought, it was a great show. The guest was awesome, very knowledgeable. And the best thing about this episode was that it adds in a unique perspective and a path to FI. Lucas, thank you for your feedback. I think like I agree with the heart of everything that you're saying, but I but I also where I end up landing is that unique path to FI. You don't have to do exactly what we're doing. You don't have to do exactly what JW is doing. But I think there's so much to glean from that episode on how exciting life can be when you're no longer paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, and I think that unique path to FI is probably the most important part there. That we all have different skills, we all have different paths, we all have different things that we're scared of, things that help us sleep at night. Lucas, I get it, man. I I absolutely get what you're saying. I guess I'd just rather hope for an 8% return in VTSAX and sleep better and have more free time. Well, that's great. That's the path that I personally take. And I do sleep better at that. And for me, the boogeyman has always kind of been real estate investing which in theory, I would love to do it, but having a a real estate rental that I own and have to deal with renters and all this other nonsense like maintenance and things breaking, like 
that would keep me up at night. I just know that it would. And I find it hard to believe that I'll ever be able to get over that. I hope that I will, because I know it's a nice way to diversify. And certainly real estate in general is a nice way to diversify. So I suspect I'm going to find ways to do that. But but that's something that that would keep me up at night. So I totally get it. If buying a business and trying to figure out how to have employees who do weird crap, right? That like JW was telling us about and worrying about adding value and worrying about making payroll and all this other stuff, having benefits. I mean, like think about all the different things you have to deal with as an employer. Like that sounds pretty bad to me. I'm not sure that like in my life I want to inject that. But the cool thing with JW and his three brothers, well, two of them, are running this business full time. That's their job. So like they signed up for that. And I suspect that went into the operating agreement in great detail of like, hey, what is everybody doing in this business? So like JW sounds like more of a big idea guy and the bankroll or part of it with his with his older brother. And it doesn't sound like he's in the day to day operations of this business. So even if you were in his situation and your brothers came to you and had this idea. Well, there are still that entire spectrum of like how you can be involved. So I think the real moral is just look at every situation that comes to you and address how it would or would not fit into your life. And if that extra work makes sense. So I, I definitely want to just like touch on the math here. Like, you know, the the eight percent in VTSAX versus a return in the teens. So let's say he doubles it, right? He gets a 16 percent return. That doesn't mean he's doubling his money. It means his money is doubling in half the time. So like that's an exponential increase, especially over decades. And so that difference is enormous. It's not just, oh, he's going to have twice as much money 50 years from now. He's not going to have just double his money in 50 years. It's going to be dramatically more than that. All right. So Brad, I, I went ahead and just ran a calculation so that we could have some numbers to work with. Let's operate off the fact, let's say that JW is uh, 35 years old and he's going to, this business, he's going to be in this business in some shape or form for 15 years. So from 35 to 50, his initial investment, let's say he put in, and we don't know, he didn't tell us, but let's say that his investment was $200,000 to get this business going. And he's expecting a 16% rate of return on that money. And that is instead of the 8% that he's getting in VTSAX. And he doesn't invest any additional money back into this business. But when he checks his portfolio, it's returning about 16% a year. So if he got 8% on that money, he would have, if he just put that money in VTSAX, let it ride for 15 years, he would have $634,000. But if he's making 16% annual year over year rate of return by having that money invested in the business, he's going to have almost $2 million instead. So almost, I would say about three times the amount he would have if he had just invested it in VTSAX. So I think it's a very fine line. I've told you guys before that I don't worry too much about how I can squeeze out that extra one or 2%, especially if it means that I'm going to be trying to dance in and out of the market, or I'm going to have to go get some sort of actively managed fund where they're going to be siphoning it off, uh, you know, the, the equivalent one or 2%. I just don't see the value in that, but I do see the value in getting 16 to 20% rate of returns year over year. So if you can find a vehicle that's marginally passive, like JW is, is, is potentially going to get here where he's checking in on a week on a week to week basis, but his siblings are gr running and growing the business and he's kind of working on it at a, at a big level picture, then yeah, that's worth an extra $1.2 million, which I totally see the value in. So Lucas was mentioning, well, JW and his brothers, they're CPAs, they're MBAs. And I love that you highlighted the aspect of skill set because I don't think you need to get too hung up on the CPA or MBA, but just think what skills can I draw from in my background that I can leverage and put into a business to increase that return and maybe double the rate of return that the business had been getting up to this point, or maybe just increase it by three or 4%, pushing that return up into the teens. That's Think about the advantage you have over maybe someone else that was doing a similar business, but didn't have that skill set and couldn't take that next step and didn't know how to grow that business. What can you bring to the table? And, and whatever that looks like, doesn't matter what the table looks like, but what can you bring to that situation that maybe somebody else can't? Yeah. And frankly, it could just be hustle. Right. Like it could just be passion. I'm not sure that it, it has to be some skill. And I'm not sure, frankly, that like being a CPA or an MBA is going to do anything for whatever business that JW necessarily has. He said it was some type of industrial services. I, I frankly don't know what that means. And obviously he, he doesn't publicly say, but 
I'm a CPA. I'm not sure that I can necessarily add a ton of value, but maybe the two younger brothers with a lot of hustle could add a lot of value. Right. So like like I said before, I, I agree with a ton of what Luke has said in his in his comment. And I get where he's coming from. But like to me, that sounds like a limiting belief. They're rock stars. They're CPAs and MBAs. Well, like I'm a CPA. I wouldn't feel like I'd walk into a business and be a rock star. Like I think Lucas or anybody in the community would have the same ability to affect change as I would, which is you walk in, you survey the scene, you see what's working, what isn't working. You talk to your employees and you hustle and you put in the hours and you figure it out. So like, I wouldn't get caught up on that kind of stuff at all. I love your point about hustle, Brad. And I just want to say like, there are so many, I guess you could say quote unquote blue collar jobs where I feel like just showing up is 90% of the game. Like if you have a contractor that is just there when they say they will be there and then does the work they say they will do, you've already separated yourself out from the pack. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that is, it's funny because um, my father-in-law listens to this podcast and and he is constantly talking about how that is precisely it. Like he always has work being done on his house, it seems like. And he calls 10 different companies and maybe one or two show up, period. And if you get one out of 10 to show up on time in a professional manner, it's it's amazing. And I mean, that's just not good enough. Like, so if you can just do the basics, right? Like, you in some professions, you're way, way, way ahead of the game. And I mean that it's just it's doing the right things. Like we said, it's it's the hustle. It's being professional. Like there are just little things that you can add that like that just might set you apart in whatever industry you're in. I don't know if if in this industrial services industry, like something like that would change. But like maybe you being in your regular day to day job, like you have a level of professionalism that you're used to. And if you can inject that into this new business, like that might be the three or 4% a year, just something as simple as that, that would move the needle. So like, don't get stuck in limiting beliefs like, oh, I can't add value. Like it's about having these various skills you just pick up in your life by reading, by listening to podcasts, just be interesting and be interested Mm -hmm. in learning new things. And you never know where that talent stack is going to help you in the future. You just simply can't know, but just keep adding these skills in your life and good things will happen. I know I see that in my own life. I don't think that I'm great at any one single thing, but like I've picked up a bunch of skills over the last 10 or 15 years. And I think it adds up to me being like a fairly valuable person in general, but I'm not complacent. I know less than 1% of what there is to know. And like, I constantly want to learn. I constantly want to find out new things. And like, I think that kind of inquisitive mind is what's going to help you succeed in life. And, you know, when I look at my own skill sets, not a CPA, don't have an MBA, but when I look at JW situation, I think, all right, what could I bring to a table? Let's say I found a small business that I could buy into. What could I do to dramatically improve the business, which the implication would be it would improve my return on investment over a period of time. Let's say this business is undervalued or people are jumping ship because the culture is bad. Can I improve the culture? Can I improve the environment that people are working in? Can I remove the bad elements either through attrition, through new hires? Can I improve the marketing by improving the brand and the reputation? Can I improve it through networking and meeting with people that will benefit from our services? Were those being done well? And then you got to look at your strengths. Obviously, you got to look at your weaknesses. It's called a SWOT test and you can get into your opportunities. And there are ways at a very granular level that if you're willing to be a lifelong learner and learn how to affect change, it's much easier on the smaller scale of a single business than it is on a massive ship or a massive corporation. Uh, You can make turns very quickly, which means there's opportunities to identify inefficiencies in the market and businesses that have the opportunity or could be performing at a much higher level and turn that around for real financial gain. Anyways, guys, great feedback. I hope that there were some takeaways that even if you are not going to go out and purchase an industrial services business, you can see the value of being in our community and realizing that When you have money to invest, you should be in some way, shape, or form taking advantage of your tax advantage vehicles and generally following the simple path to wealth, whatever that looks like for you. But you don't need to be limited to that. And at some point, you may have the option for a more creative investment to not just save money, but potentially produce multiple income streams. And there are advantages to small business ownership that are worth discussing over and over again. The Choose FI community is not limited to extreme frugality. And our goal is not to convince you to live on $5,000 a year, but rather it is to highlight the diversity of the paths that different people choose so that you get to choose which one suits the life that you want to live.
All right, guys, I couldn't be more excited to let you know that Stephen, the organizer behind Camp Fi, is right now setting up the next event, which is going to be happening in April of 2018. And it's going to be Camp Fi Mid Atlantic. He's found a location in Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, Brad and I are absolutely attending. He is not yet opening this up to the public, but he said for our community, he would give us a link so that our community got first dibs to those tickets. We would love to see you there. You guys know how passionate we are about growing this community and really partnering with you on this journey. And it's just amazing that this opportunity has opened up. And we hope that if that interests you, if you want to hang out with two normal guys, play some board games, hear some great speakers, listen to some awesome topics, and just be motivated and encouraged on this path, you would consider just coming and joining in the fun. So that's going to be April 2018. We're setting up the short link. You can just go to choosefi.com slash campfi, C-A-M-P-F-I, campfi. And those tickets are going to be opened up early release just for the Choose FI community right now. Yeah, and that's April 13th through the 16th of 2018. And yeah, we'd absolutely love to meet you. This is basically right in our backyard. It's less than an hour from each of our houses, which is cool and a nice central location. So yeah, I mean, I hope uh, Stephen is anticipating at least 50 people will be there. So there are 50 tickets and they are going to go pretty quickly. So if you're interested in signing up, yeah, like Jonathan said, it's chooseify.com forward slash camp FI. Brad, Stacy really highlighted this quote. I'm going to go ahead and take credit for this because I don't think I've seen anybody else say this and I know I said it on the show. So Stacy is giving me credit for the quote, collect skills, not stuff. If you know somebody else that said that first, please don't correct me. I'd just like to roll with it and have it on my tombstone. So we're going to go with it. But that to me, that's my life motto right now. Like I'm latching on to that. And, and I realized it appeals to me for, mul- for multiple reasons. One, I think the past mentality, the way our country is kind of set up is we try to get people to be a master of one thing. We, we tell you that you need to decide what you're going to do at the age of you know 16 or 17. And you go get a college degree that's in that particular field. And, and then you're in that field, but you're in that field with 60 or $70,000 of student loan debt, which is going to take you 30 or 40 years to pay off. So you kind of need the security of what you're good at. So you're kind of trapped in this hamster wheel. But What appeals to me about our community and the way that we tackle this game is that we have reached financial freedom within a period of five to 15 years. And our focus the entire time is on just becoming a hopefully happier, but along the way, a more useful person through the development of skills. And my focus has been instead of focusing on one thing and being the best at that one thing, which I will never be, I am moderately okay at a hundred different things. This gives me an excuse to collect these different skills. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is to set up this idea that we'd like to explore further of a maker space. Now, some of you have heard of this before. I had not as of about a month ago. And since I heard about it once, it's amazing how you hear about this idea one time and then suddenly you hear about it everywhere. And apparently there are these places all over the United States that are dedicated to the idea of teaching you new skills and allowing you to use tools that are in place for a large group of people that share similar interests. So instead of you going to get a gym membership where you're just, you know, you have access to the barbells and the treadmills, you have access to woodworking equipment, welding, 3D printing. And these places are set up generally, they partner with different schools and businesses and just individuals that are interested in paying a monthly fee to go in and have access to this equipment. And This concept really just came across my desk, but it's very appealing to me that instead of me having to go out and purchase, you know, $20,000 of premium woodworking equipment that maybe I, maybe I get a chance to use once a month or so, I can find one of these places and actually go there and get a chance to use all of this premium equipment to create these different projects. And I get to do it under the supervision of someone that can coach me through the process if I need their help with that learning curve. So this just blew my mind that this was even available. And apparently, Brad, there's one here in Richmond. Is it really? That really is. So I am in the process of reaching out. Maybe we can get them to come on the show and talk a little bit about their business model. But there are there probably is one in your area and you would just want to Google the name of your city and maker space or creator space. But I think that would just be a really cool thing. If this excites you and you've thought, well, I just don't have room in my backyard or I don't have the budget for all this equipment that you would need to get started with that. Why don't you just go see, get a day pass, go get a monthly membership, go, go check it out. See if there's a place that will feed into this lifelong love of learning new skills. I just think that's really cool. And once you free up your time, you no longer have to be at your nine to five every single day. What are you going to fill that with? And in my mind, 
assuming that it's not some sort of business, small business that I'm continuing to work on, my free time would obviously at bare minimum be accruing new skills because it brings joy to my life. Yeah, that's interesting. I I know obviously there are many, many tens of thousands of skills you can pick up. I'm not sure in my own life that woodworking or any of this stuff would would personally fit in, but I know for you it does, which is awesome. But what does strike me about that is the sharing aspect. Like, you know, Jonathan, that, that I talk about that all the time. Like, I wish instead of me having a garage filled with lawnmowers and weed whackers and hedge clippers and all this other random stuff that I use 30 minutes a year that I, like I could share these things with my neighbors and we could all like have some pooled resources. Like to me, that would be awesome and would be a really efficient way to not have to waste money on stuff that just sits idle all the time. So like that appeals to me about the makerspace. I really, I like the shared aspect of it. And I also, of course, like the community aspect. And what it it reminds me of is the Mr. Money Mustache World Headquarters that he just opened recently. And like, that's something that probably appeals to me on a more personal level, which is getting together. It's like a co-working space, but essentially for people of the FI and entrepreneurial mindset. So I just love what he is going there. Like he has an exercise squat rack out in the back. He's got uh, local beer that I think some of the people who actually are part of that community are brewing up on a weekly basis or whatever, whatever until it's exhausted. And, and more importantly, like they're sitting there, they're sharing ideas. It's this creative space. I think that's, that's what you're talking about with the maker space. Like you're sharing in this creativity and like good things happen sometimes like that you just can't predict when you're around other people who are interesting and who are interested in learning new things. So like, I'd love to see something like what Pete has done at his world headquarters pop up for the Phi community in other areas and cities where there's a, a large concentration of people in the Phi community or mustachians or whatever you want to call us. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that really, really appeals to me. So I, 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 Hopefully, we'll have some updates and, uh, you know, we'll see if, if that is an idea that can spread. Brad, I think the part that you highlighted was the idea of perfect utilization. And I know most of us can identify with the fact that our cars do sit unused 90 something odd percent of the time. And the extension of that would be how much stuff do you have in your house that you really want to get rid of, but you just can't get the inertia to get moving on that. And we've talked about the idea of donating uh, in the past, but there's another idea that's come on my radar that holds some significant appeal to me uh, just because it brings in this aspect of community. And that's the idea of a buy nothing project. Now you can go to buy nothing project.org. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And Tiffany mentioned this on the Facebook group, but her inspiration for really sharing this with us was uh, the conversation of the alley will provide and buy nothing project.org is this community based idea that you can actually start in your specific neighborhood. And you can do it even through a Facebook group, which is private that you allow people to join if this is something that they are actively participating in. But think about all the stuff that you have in your house that maybe made sense two or three or four years ago when you purchased it or acquired it somehow. But now you just, you don't use it, but you don't want to get rid of it because you want it to go to a good place. And you can't quite bring yourself to take it to just a thrift store because you have a feeling it's just going to disappear or it's just not going to be used or, you know, you just want to see it placed in a good home. Well, Buy Nothing Group will take care of that because the idea is you can post things. You're not asking for money for these objects. You're not trying to get a good deal on it or a good price on it. You're just sharing it with people in your neighborhood that could benefit. And what may have served you several years ago that no longer serves you now may be the exact thing that someone else was looking for. Think about what you have to share. Some people have basil and fresh herbs that go off one week after they're picked and they make so much they can't use it all. And you're going to the grocery store and you're purchasing all this stuff and hemorrhaging money on these tiny little seasonings that you need for these little meals that you make once every couple of weeks or so. Maybe that's something that you have to offer that then is feeding into this idea of community. It's bringing people together for these frugal alternatives. So you're actually organically creating a community that has an emphasis on value, has an emphasis on frugality and intentional living. And you're able to contribute because you have all this stuff but you can slowly get rid of that and declutter your house while at the same time helping these other families out that are maybe looking for something that you no longer need. What a what just a fantastic and inspirational idea, Brad. And I think some people have been asking themselves, how can I interact with my neighbors? How can I get that dialogue started? And this has to be the gateway to that conversation. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I frankly have never heard of that before. So this is something I'm going to look into and we'll definitely link that up in the show notes. All right, guys. So today we do want to make a travel rewards update. Uh, within the last, probably I would say two to three weeks, Chase did make some changes to their program and what you can and can't get. And since a lot of you have learned about travel rewards through our episode nine, where we basically walk you through how to get started with this really incredible alternate look on how to travel the world for for very little cost, just changing the way that you're doing your normal spending, not spending more, but just changing the way you're doing your normal spending. But there have been some changes made to the Chase program, and we thought it was important just to take a couple minutes and highlight that. And the biggest change, and maybe Brad can break it down, was that last year there was just the Chase Sapphire Preferred. And then last fall, Chase introduced this new card called the Chase Sapphire Reserve. And for a short period of time, they were letting you get both of those. But as of this year, they've implemented a new rule saying that you have to pick. You have to get one or the other. Now, I think Brad and I would make the case that in our minds even though both have their own advantages and disadvantages. In our minds, it makes more sense, especially when you're starting out to go with the preferred. But the implications of that are that if you open the preferred, you are not then able to immediately open up the reserve right after that. You have to pick between one or the other. Now, there is a workaround which Brad can show you, but I just think we wanted to take just a couple minutes to let you know that that is a change that has been made to the Chase program. Yeah. So Jonathan, this was quote unquote major news in the travel rewards world, but I I don't think it's a sky is falling type scenario at all, at least to me. Like this wasn't even something that I was losing sleep over by any means. Yeah. At the end of August, Chase basically said you can have two of their Sapphire branded cards at the same time. So that does cut out a second potential sign up bonus. And that is obviously unfortunate. As, as we've said many times, the Chase ultimate rewards points are what we consider the most valuable of all the travel rewards points. And yeah, I mean, that's things. But still, in the grand scheme of things, you can get one of these Sapphire bonuses, which currently, at the time of our recording here, they're both 50,000 points. And there are cards like the Chase Inc. Business Preferred, which currently has an 80,000 point bonus. So there are still ways to accumulate Chase Ultimate Rewards points, certainly. But basically, they're saying you cannot have two of these at the same time. So if your account is closed and you haven't gotten a bonus on any Sapphire card in the last 24 months, then you can sign up for a new one. So it's the same rule that's been in existence for reopening a card and getting the bonus again, which is 24 months. But they're just kind of combining the Chase Sapphire Preferred and the Chase Sapphire Reserve essentially into one in that in that regard when you're considering that bonus stipulation. So just like anything in life, rules change, things change. You have to just figure out what's the best to go forward and go with it. So while this isn't ideal, it, this is not a sky is falling situation. And one thing you can do if you really wanted, you can upgrade or downgrade your card. So theoretically, if you open up the Sapphire Preferred first and you then want to upgrade that card to a Sapphire Reserve, albeit that does come with a hefty $450 annual fee. So this is not something to get into lightly by any means, but there is a $300 annual travel credit, which helps then reduce that to net out of pocket $150. Plus there are a lot of benefits of having that reserve. So uh, one, probably the most important one is that when you book your travel through the Chase Ultimate Rewards portal, you actually get 1.5 cents in value, as opposed to if you just had the Chase Sapphire Preferred card, you would only get 1.25 cents in value. So there's some potential there, especially if you have a lot of these points, to maybe make up that annual fee and almost reduce it down to zero. So, you know, it's just something to consider. I know this is a lot of detail in this, but long story short, there's this new rule that you basically cannot get two of these bonuses at the same time. You have to wait two years. And there are plenty of Chase cards that we love other than these Sapphire cards. They're United credit cards. There are British Airways and Southwest cards. Hyatt has one, Marriott. I mean, there are tons of Chase cards to get. So by no means does this destroy the travel rewards concept, but it's just one of many, many changes. And I can assure you there will be more changes in the future and we will keep abreast of them and, and keep you updated. 
All right, guys. So unfortunately, that is going to bring this episode to a close. Thank you for joining us today as as we get a chance to really learn this stuff right along with you guys. We finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we found useful. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been doing J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth, Dominic Corpuccio's book, Design Your Future. And then for a short period of time, we're also including in this Tim Ferriss' book, A Tools of Titans. And all you have to do to enter the drawing is just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes, leave us a short written review, and then just send us an email to feedback at choosefi.com, letting us know that you left the review and what screen name you left it under. We do one book for every five written reviews that we get, and then we announce the winners on the Friday roundup. And just for me to stress this, for those of you that have been listening week after week and you keep getting something new that's adding value, we get that you putting your stamp of approval on the show and leaving that written review is doing us a massive favor. But this just gives us a small way that we can share our appreciation and we can share something that's totally in line with what we're about, which is a love of learning. So if you have been considering leaving us a written review, please take this opportunity, do it this week. We are so appreciative. And then also one other thing that we haven't mentioned, and we just really, we haven't done a great job at just saying this is another way that you can really help us out is just to press the subscribe button on whatever app that you listen to us on. It basically, it tells iTunes or it tells the Android player that you place value in this show. It helps us rank higher and it also helps us bring on these higher profile guests. So we, we are going to keep this thing going. We are going to be here every single week as you continue to go down this path that all of us have chosen together. And if you want to help us out, just make sure you do take a second and hit the subscribe button on the app that you use to listen to this show. And we, we just absolutely appreciate you. So Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right. We actually have two winners this week. And the first one is D. And D called this the best five podcast around. I love, love this podcast. Every Monday and Friday, I search this out for my commute to and from work. With a 30-minute drive, I'm forced to listen to this with a break in the middle. After parked, I have to pull myself away from the banter and make my way through my day in order to listen to the remainder on my way home. After listening to a few Mad Finds' podcasts, I found you because of the interview with him and was so impressed I tore through all of your episodes. Now it's sad that I'm up to date and I have to wait for new episodes. Keep up the great work. (laughs) <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'm glad you're caught up though. That uh, I feel like those of you that are binge listening to us like 40 episodes in a row, you start to learn real quickly what wonderful words I have and how often I use them. <laughs> <laughs> They're catchphrases, man. Come on. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> All right. And our next winner is Justin. And Justin says... The Bigger Picture of Life, the Chooseify podcast will hook your interest from the second you hit play. Jonathan and Brad cover the material to include every listener. I found this podcast at the perfect moment in life where I wanted to know what's next with my finances and what are we actually working towards. The guests on this show absolutely crush their lifestyle goals, and it shows that there is more than one way to reach Fi. I introduced the podcast to my wife at episode 38, The Why of Fi, and she has since started on the rest of the podcast. Keep up the great work. Absolutely love the show and all the amazing information you provide your listeners. We are currently working on our way to FI so we can become firewalkers. Welcome to our community, Justin. We appreciate that you're here and we're super excited that your wife is with you on this journey. How amazing is that, Brad? Yeah, that's great. And and the why of FI is a perfect place to start. So yeah, that's, that's very, very cool. So welcome and thank you for leaving the review. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.